Hello and welcome to our final webinar of 2019, Letting Bike Riders Catch the Green Wave. My name is Brendan Williams. I am the Research Program Administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. TREK leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, one of seven national university transportation centers funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NITSI consortium members are the University of Arizona, University of Oregon, University of Utah, University of Texas at Arlington, and Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. It is our goal to provide you with usable research results. You will receive an email with the survey link we appreciate your feedback. Our presenters today are Dr. Stephen Ficus and Dr. Mark Schlossberg of the University of Oregon. Stephen is a professor in the Computer and Information Science Department. His research focuses on technology to support public and alternative transportation. He has a particular interest in transportation technology that is affordable and scalable. Stephen is a participating member of three technical committees under the broader SAE Vehicle to Everything Communications Steering Committee. The dedicated short range communication technical committee, which sets standards for communication format. The vehicular applications technical committee, which sets standards for message content, along with use cases, and the cross-cutting technical committee, which integrates format and content, content for vehicle to everything. His particular focus is on vulnerable road users. Mark is a professor of planning, public policy and management, and co-director of the Sustainable Cities Institute. He is a national expert on redesigning streets and cities for more space efficient modes of transport. His two recent case study books, Rethinking Streets and Rethinking Streets for Bikes, have been downloaded over 6,000 times in more than 20 countries by politicians, transportation professionals, academics and students, and general community members, demonstrating a strong commitment of translating knowledge to practice. He teaches courses on sustainable transportation and bicycle transportation. This is NITSI's last event for 2019, but we do have some upcoming events set for 2020. We will announce several more um, in January. But uh, for those of you who are attending TRB 2020 in Washington, DC, NITSI is holding a reception on Monday, January 13th from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. at Fado Irish Pub. Our next webinar is on January 22nd, uh, presented by Dr. Becky Steckler and Dr. Robin, Rebecca Lewis from the University of Oregon on their project, Navigating New Mobility, Emerging Technologies and Cities. A brief overview of the webinar, um, Stephen and Mark will present for about 40 minutes. During their presentation, please submit your questions via the GoToWebinar control panel. We will have about 15 minutes after their presentation to answer as many of the audience's questions as we can. We are recording today's webinar and we will make it available on our website. You will receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in the email. With that, I hand it over to Stephen and Mark. Great. Uh, thank you very much. This is Mark, and um, it's great to have everyone on the webinar. And 
Steve and I will be doing a little bit of a fun tag team uh, with the planner and the computer scientist uh, going at it. So the process here will be, I will start and give a little bit of context about the projects and, and place it into the who cares and so what uh, framework, which is important for all the work that all of us do. And then uh, Steve will go through uh, a few of the iterations of the projects that we've done around this idea of, of helping to create green waves uh, for people on bike. Um, so get into a little bit of the technical details and then I'll come back at the end and, and kind of wrap things up and we're happy to have discussion questions that either get into the technical side or big picture side uh, wherever that might go wherever that might be so uh, here we go so sort of the who cares and, and so what our basic um, starting point here is that uh, we want to increase the amount of cycling that's happening in communities across the country. And we want to do that because studies show that more people actually want to bike um, uh, in their daily life than their local environment supports. And that um, having more trips by bike is critical for a whole lot of uh, social and environmental reasons, well, for the environment, for our health, for our freedom and independence of more people in our community to get around and live their lives in the ways that they want to do for helping to create socially cohesive or more socially cohesive societies for reasons of household affordability, and general notions of happiness. And I should say here, just as a small aside, that last week I was in uh, Madrid for the COP25, first week of the COP25 um, climate conference. This is the, the UN conference that's going on right now. It's, uh, I've been following it in the news, either because of things that are going on or by side news going on about it. Um, but anyway, uh, what became really clear to me, at least during the first week uh, while I was there attending different sessions, was that on the transportation sector around uh, meeting our uh, climate crisis needs, there was a lot of discussion around um, substitute fuels in the transportation sector as, the, um, as really the primary strategy for addressing um, CO2 emissions. And our take is like, that's fine, uh, but we also need to reduce car trips. And one of the ways that we can uh, help more people meet more of their daily uh, needs, especially in communities in the US where the distances between origins and destinations are a little bit um, longer because of our land use pattern, is through making our communities more um, bike accessible. So there's lots of reasons why we want to do that. But currently, the system doesn't work for, for most of these users who say they would like to bike more of the time but can't. And one of them is because we lack a, a safe infrastructure that, or an infrastructure that helps people um, feel safe. And we can do that through more protected lanes. But the other is that as we get to intersections, which are critically important in the network, uh, especially with signalized intersections, the pace along those corridors and in those intersections, uh, those traffic signals are almost never timed for the pace of someone on a bike and instead are timed uh, when they are timed or uh, when they are um, actuated by users, uh, they tend to be much more responsive um, to vehicular uh, drivers, to people in cars than people on bike. And then the sort of last piece that's motivating our work is that we're really interested in the, in the V2X world, the vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle, um, communication, everything that's sort of um, evolving as we speak and that uh, people on bike tend not to be anywhere uh, uh, part of those conversations in any sort of real way. Uh, bikes get brought into the conversation as objects for vehicles to avoid rather than as uh, full uh, participants in the transportation uh, sector of how we move about our cities. And so we're really interested in um, elevating the role of people on bikes uh, in, the, in the V2X world, um, especially before AVs get rolled out in any real way uh, now is the time to set some of those standards. So then um, traffic signals and green waves is, is what we're thinking about here. And you know, so why traffic signals? Well, obviously because those are the, the pinch points at uh, many intersections on our main corridors where the places that we wanna either uh, go to or along those corridors that are, should be the, the fast, most, fastest, most convenient way for us getting um, to where we wanna go. And there's two types of traffic signals that we have to deal with. There's the, the actuated and the fixed time types of signals, and they each uh, represent different challenges for us as we're thinking about um, people on bike or thinking about all the mix that's happening on our streets. So the actuated signals are the ones where 
they're kind of responsive to uh, users, uh, usually through a, um, some type of um, loop detector in the ground or sometimes through a video camera, seeing who's where and, and how to change the signal based on um, where someone's waiting to go. And then, of course, there's traffic signals that are just on a fixed time that they um, rotate through their, their cycles uh, in fixed time. And so those present different challenges on how we might want to help people on bike uh, get some optimization through a traffic signal system uh, uh, you know, in this complex world. So we've, uh, we're have we in the in the midst of a, a third uh, a project that we'll go through because uh, they're all kind of connected. Um, and we and Steve will go through some of the details of each one of these. So the so one of them was uh, if we could figure out a way to really seamlessly and easily help people on bike change traffic signals proactively um, by essentially at, um, creating our own um, app and box to it attach to existing infrastructure in a city, uh, so that based on um, you know, the speed and direction of travel, someone on a bike can proactively you know hit the button before they get there. So that it's green when they arrive, and we created a whole system that Steve will go through called the Bike Connect system, and also show a little video about that in a moment. And then um, we also wanted to see if, uh, in those places where we can't uh, change the traffic signals because they're on a fixed time, is there a way that we can provide information to cyclists that gives them uh, information in an easy to use way that tells them to speed up, slow down, maintain their existing pace in order to increase the likelihood uh, that they will um, get a green. So um, uh, we're doing some of that through machine learning of historic data, through direct signal feeds of the traffic signal system, or through some combination uh, of those data sources. So right now I'm gonna show a really quick video to explain the Bike Connect system, then I'll turn it over to uh, Steve to go into the weeds. So hopefully, um, hopefully this works good enough. And if not, you can see that the link is there for you to look at later on or share with your colleagues. All right, here we go. While cities all over the world are working to promote bicycle transportation through new infrastructure and initiatives, we still have a long way to go. Studies show that over 50% of Americans are interested in using a bike some of the time, but feel that the current infrastructure is too dangerous, too disconnected, or too inefficient for them to use due to unsafe bike lanes on busy roads, suddenly ending paths, and traffic signals that seem to be responsive and timed exclusively for cars, adding delay and inconvenience to people on bike. Especially on bike, wouldn't it be helpful if a traffic signal could sense our approach and know to turn green as we arrive? Or wouldn't it be nice to know whether to speed up or slow down a little to make an upcoming green light? Or at a red light, wouldn't it be nice to know how long to wait for a green? And all without pushing a button or riding over a sensor? That's what's possible with the Bike Connect system, the result of an exploratory research project between the University of Oregon and the City of Eugene, sponsored by the National Institute for Transportation and Communities. Bike Connect is a combination of new hardware, existing traffic signal data systems, and a new app-based controller and data communication system designed to give strategic priority to people on bike. There are two aspects of the Bike Connect system, the virtual sensor and the signal to user communication. Utilizing an inexpensive control box that can attach to any existing traffic signal system and a customized app, Bike Connect works like virtually pushing a crosswalk button in advance. For fixed time signals, the app can let users know to speed up, slow down, or remain at current speed to help users catch a green wave. In both cases, a virtual countdown timer can let users know how long until the green, making biking more convenient and enjoyable. We have many ideas for next steps, including installing the Bike Connect system along corridors or regions to create complete green wave systems, testing the system in additional cities and conditions and developing a voice-activated, screenless version with additional tools for cyclists. We're looking into combining the voice-activated tools with game-like incentives to help more kids bike to school more often, and are also exploring the testing of advanced bicycle-to-vehicle and bicycle-to-infrastructure systems in a controlled bicycle and automobile simulation lab. There are many reasons to make it easier for more people to use a bike more of the time. Bicycles are space-efficient on our streets, 
energy efficient for our climate, cost efficient for our wallets and our taxes, good for our health, and they put smiles on our faces. We believe that people on bikes should be planned for purposefully and proactively, and the Bike Connect system can help cities make it easier for more people to bike more of the time. All right. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Steve to actually go into some of the weeds of how these things are working. Go for it, Steve. Let me make sure. Yeah. You should have the ability to advance the slides now. Yeah, not working. <laughs> Okay, so you can just say uh, next slide. Um, okay, uh, welcome everyone. This is uh, Steve, and uh, the term weeds is Mark's term. I I kind of prefer treetops. Uh, so what I want to do, one of my big goals in going over these projects is to give you an idea of the hardware and software we pulled together and how easy it is uh, for someone else uh, to do the same thing in their city. So I'll go over at a pretty high level the kind of things we were we ended up using. So you, you can go ahead and advance, Mark. You can do all three of them. Okay, and you should be able to do it now too, I think. Okay, let me give it a shot. So I'm gonna, we're gonna take these uh, projects and chronological order, it was kind of interesting that between uh, uh, study one and study two, we kind of got a new piece of technology, which I'll describe, which uh, was a help for sure. Um, so let me see if I can now advance. Yeah, still not working for me, Mark. Thank you. Uh, so this this first study is not is not the green wave study. I'll get to that in, in study two. This was uh, our first study to see if we could actually put virtual calls uh, onto a, a controller, a signal controller. It, it started really with us noticing uh, at an inter busy intersection that there was a bike loop, but it was it was just not very effective. Uh, either people didn't know it was there. They didn't know even if it was there, if they'd actually signaled, uh, got got a uh, signal through and so forth. So we we thought maybe there's a better way to do this. Now, some I know some cities, for instance, Portland actually put a blue light up on uh, to tell bikers that they have actually triggered the intersection. But now we're talking about adding actually signage to tell them what the blue light was about. And so we just decide if we could see if we can short circuit that. And so the general idea uh, is that the cyclists, we built an app, uh, a phone app, and the cyclists could carry that. It could be in the backpack. We we show it mounted on the uh, handlebars here, but it could go in a backpack. Uh, and then our goal was to, in essence, compute the user's direction, bearing speed, and then at the right time, put a call in to the to the signal and hopefully the, the the bike rider would have a green when they got to the signal. So I think we ended up roughly around uh, 50 to 100 feet as the as the place that we actually ended up kind of using for the virtual signal. But I mean that can all be customized, so that was not a problem. Okay, Mark. So I want to just kind of tell you uh, briefly about the intersection we were working with. Uh, this is looking south at the top, and you can see there's a bike signal. There's roughly four phases on this intersection, uh, and the uh, vehicle ped is the resting state, so it would be the cross traffic on the top uh, image there. Uh, there's a vehicle, a bike, and a ped. And the tricky part here, this is uh, an actuated signal, was uh, that the phase is roughly, or following what I have on the bottom vehicle pet as the resting state. Uh, if there is a call on any of those others, then that's the order they'll go in. 
If there's no call, then that phase will be skipped. But knowing this at the time of this study, uh, we didn't know it. So, I mean, we knew the, the phase diagram, but we didn't know if there was any calls. Uh, so it made it, it made it a challenge, and that's actually where a little bit of machine learning came in to try to figure out uh, what was potentially ahead, if there were any phases ahead of the bike, the bike rider before they got to the signal. So I, I think that was a, basically the major challenge here. Okay, you can skip ahead, Mark. Uh, one more. So we decided uh, we decided to use uh, a commercial cloud-based system. It's called MQTT, uh, an MQTT broker. And it's, I like it, and I think I really recommend it. It's the general, I, not necessarily the particle cloud. I'll tell you why we use that in just a minute. But the this it's a publish subscribe model and it allows you to really have unlimited signals on the left and unlimited number of apps on the right and they can come and go easily in real time so it, it was it's pretty flexible and i think it's it's the right way to go in essence for this kind of application the city also wanted us to put a kill switch in uh, just so they could take the system down if they wanted to we gave them that uh, they haven't used it, thank God, but it is there. Okay, you want to hit it again, Mark? So here's the, I guess, kind of the solution and the problem at the same time. Uh, there was no way uh, at the time of this study for us to actually uh, access the signal controller directly. Uh, and so we ended up having to build our own box, which was an intermediary uh, the box actually uses this particle uh, electron chip, which is, is pretty dang cool. If, if you don't know about it, it's got a SIM uh, card on it, and it's relatively inexpensive, around $50. Uh, and then the sale cost can be as cheap as $3, $3 a month, which is not too bad. And so that was what we put in the box. So we had the box had cell connection up to the particle cloud. And then the app also had access. And then we wired in the box into the actual controller. And that's as we tapped into the bike loop uh, circuit. So that's that's the kind of piece here if you were gonna try to duplicate this, but I wanna say more about that in just a minute uh, and actually uh, have virtual calls. Uh, the city, <laughs> We couldn't talk the city into putting our box inside the cabinet, uh, so we had them mounted up on the. That's us, all us on the left there, standing and watching them. The city, about five of us watching, and one person doing the work of putting the box uh, up on the pole, and that that got a little spendy. So that was around 2.5k for that installation process. Okay, Mark. You can you can go through all of them, Mark. So uh, we had ten riders over three months, uh, spring and summer of 2018. Uh, we had uh, information from the app, and then we, we asked, asked for user feedback. Uh, uh, the bottom line was that it it riders were happy with it. Uh, they were getting greens most of the time, and they thought it uh, provided a positive value to the ride. Okay, Mark. Okay, so on the downside or the, the well, yeah, it was a small study. There was no control group. Uh, user feedback certainly declined over time. Uh, the other piece is while MQT does support MQTT does support scale. Uh, the box, I mean, you have to build boxes and get them installed. So that's that's a scale issue. If you've got 10, 100 signals and bu building boxes and installing them is, is kind of a, a problem. Uh, and well, the last piece, which kind of uh, leads into something I'll say just a minute is, is we could do better on guessing the current phase, who's queued up and so forth, if we had info on the current phase and what's in the queue states. So that was kind of on our wish list. Okay, Mark. 
Okay, so at the moment we're in conversations with the city of Eugene and the controller manufacturer who is McCain uh, to get access to two things. Uh, information on the current controller state from the McCain cloud, which we have gotten now and we're gonna we actually use in the second study I'll talk about in just a minute uh, and the ability to place a virtual call through the McCain cloud so this we have not gotten worked out yet with McCain uh, but if if we it they do give they this is possible with their software we just haven't got permission to do it if we can get that permission then we can eliminate the box uh, which I think is a huge deal. Okay, Mark. Okay, this is actually the green wave study. So this is the second study in order. And this was a corridor application. I'll show you the corridor in just a minute. Uh, they were fixed time signals, but kind of, the, for one, they were not optimized for cyclist speed. And two, they were not synchronized <laughs> or they were partially synchronized. So it was a, a kind of a challenging quarter to work with. Uh, we ended up getting from McCain before this study started access to the current state, the current phase, and when that phase started, uh, all the signals on the corridor in real time. So our first thought was just to use kind of a dead reckoning scheme where we, we know the timing tables, we know when the controllers are reset at midnight or whatever, we could just play it forward and predict what the current phase and how long it, it, when it started, if you just give me any time of the day, but we found drift uh, in that. And so we, we ended up using that for backup, but uh, we're using the McCain information, which is coming directly from the controller uh, for the actual data we're gonna use for the making uh, green wave adjustments, okay. Okay, Mark. So this is the corridor. Uh, it's on the right is the U of O campus. And on the left are a lot of student housing areas. So it's a, it's a real feeder on the, the campus. I, I've drawn, you can kind of see the dotted lines. So signals one and two are synchronized, signals three and four are synchronized, but not, nothing else is synchronized. So even though they're fixed time, they're in essence synchronized on the north-south traffic, the cross traffic. So it's it's it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> it's, it's it's not as it's not as simple as some other quarters in, in town here. Uh, okay, on the and the bottom right, that is the lane. So that's the bike lane we're talking about. I, I want to get back to that a little later and the problems with it. Okay, Mark. So here's our setup for this problem. So McCain uh, has a transparency server. So this became available to us uh, before the study. So we're making use of it. Uh, we have our own server that's basically pinging the McCain server on a frequent basis. Uh, we built our own MQTT broker, which is not hard to do. There's op really strong open source uh, software out there for doing that. And then the uh, our apps uh, would query uh, the broker and get information about uh, signal updates, phase changes. Okay, Mark. So this is the app. Uh, the app's on the, the app screen's on the uh, left, and where the check mark is, uh, or on the right, are the possible icons uh, that can go in there. So uh, if if we see that the user's not on the corridor, then we put <clears throat> put a question mark. Um, the check means good. The red means we don't think it's possible for the user to actually make the next screen. And I should say something about this piece as well. We chose, we looked at the a Copenhagen study that looked at bike speeds. And so we, what we ended up with was uh, eight miles per hour on the, on the low side and 18 on the high side from that study. But I should say it was fixed for everyone, which is a problem. 
but that's what we went with on the on this at least this initial study and then arrows showing uh, fast or slow speed up or slow down okay anything else no I don't think so I think that's good on that slide mark so this by the way there's a lot more information on the in a paper on this which we'll show you in just a sec uh, but in the study was 30 rides split among five riders we divided between uh, pre-rush rush and post-rush pre-rush was before 8 a.m rush was eight to five and post rush was post rush was uh after five uh we provided uh right reporting forms to each user we asked them to to check off uh, on each signal on the route you can see that each column represents one of the signals on the route there were six of them uh whether they made that route and if they uh if they made that signal if not uh give us a little bit more information and also give us notes if they could on what happened okay so you can see plus green is is good uh yellow is also good uh orange purple and salmon there was some kind of problem which i'll talk about in just a sec okay mark so the the first piece is um there were riders who felt that the <clears throat> both the upper speed and the lower speed the upper speed was too pessimistic and the lower speed was too optimistic and they would they wanted to change those limits now we didn't allow them to do that during the study but that's it's on our list so it's it's that's certainly customizable to set what for each user where they want to where they want to set those limits the speed limits okay uh, another issue we ended up um, seeing at from looking at users notes was uh, we're not taking account of convoys so you can see again the bike lane up here in the right and it two, two abreast maybe but uh, there was there's a lot of swerving into the vehicle lane to pass people on this along the bike lane. And so that was the complaint was we might say, uh, you know, ride uh, 12 miles an hour to catch the next green and they were stuck behind a slow moving group of bikers. So they in essence to follow our directions would have to swerve out and, and pass them. So that's an it. Convoys are certainly an issue. Okay, Mark. So, so that Band-Aid is Mark's term here. Uh, so I'll I'll give you the bullets and I'll kind of give you my take on this. Uh, Sinking the signals to an average cyclist speed would be better. Uh, agreed. That would that would be good. And we're actually talking to the city about it. Better. Uh, wider and protected uh, bike lanes would be a huge help. I agree with that. But I also think there's something about having uh, this app and uh, being tied into the whole transportation infrastructure that, that makes it kind of cool and is a kind of a marketing piece. So I'm not sure even if we uh, got our wishes and were able to sync up signals to cycle speed and got better wider lanes i think it'd still be kind of cool to have this app so i'm not sure it's exactly it's a band-aid uh but these these other things i agree are important so these are the two uh papers coming from this there's a lot of detail in these papers so i i hope you have a chance to look at them um, but otherwise, I'm going to, I think, turn it back <clears throat> to Mark to talk about the third project. Great. Um, uh, thanks, Steve. And um, so the, the third project in this series is one that we're in the middle of right now. And um, in some ways, still trying to figure out exactly the, 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 the right way to, um, to, go, to go about it because we're sort of a data, um, data access 
uh, in a good good sort of test environment that we're finalizing right now. So anyway, what we're, what we're trying to do now is, well, one, we're expanding just the thinking and the language that we're using around this, around green ways of, of not just being for people on bike, but trying to think about micromobility more uh, broadly. Uh, many, uh, many of you might know that uh, in this last year, there were uh, as many uh, uh, trips by uh, scooter, e-scooter, as there were by bike share systems, more or less sort of doubling the number of bike bike share trips or micro mobility trips and went in the first year of scooters really being available around the country. And so the idea of, of thinking about um, how to redesign our streets or redesign our infrastructure, in this case, uh, traffic signals, so that more of these um, low carbon, low or no carbon space efficient modes of transportation continue to get uh, optimized, prioritized, um, our convenient ways of getting around uh, only lead to all kinds of um, positive benefits um, for communities. Um, so anyway, so we're expanding just our, the way that we're talking about uh, this work because it's not just for uh, people on bike, really. It's it's for uh, all micro mobility users, and, and the better the infrastructure on the street uh, that feels safe and comfortable for people on scooter or for bike, then um, you know the less we have any of. Uh, the conflicts around pedestrian or sidewalk riding or sidewalk parking or all those types of things. So anyway, uh, I'll come back to that in a second, but but for for this uh, study, we're kind of combining or evolving the last two, which is uh, uh, we're doing this as a corridor based. Uh, so like the, the last one that, that Steve just talked about, but in this case, uh, choosing a, a corridor that has both fixed time and actuated signals, so really increasing the, the complexity and also the opportunity for, um, for user-based initiation of change, but then also um, information back to the user to help, um, help the users adjust their, their behavior as well. So again, um, we want to be able to do um, some predictive. Uh, we also want to do some predictive signal assistance using the bike share system. So we're trying to talk with, uh, or we're talking with our local bike share systems called Peace Health Rides and um, to create the ability for either a subset of the fleet or um, ideally at some point the entire fleet would uh, have uh, magical abilities that if you're on a bike share system that somehow you end up getting more greens more of the time for those areas where, where we can uh, install the proactive call or uh, at least put some information to the users on the bike share system through some maybe screenless handlebar mount or something connected into the battery that alerts the users through some voice activation or buzz or something like that to speed up or slow down as Steve was talking about before. And that feels like a really nice uh, opportunity if we can make that happen, that there's this extra magic that happens for people on bike share systems. Um, grabbing the, the exact location of all bike share users, so the frequency of the GPS ping is a battery issue. For the, for the systems uh, and is also a little bit of a, of a data access issue as, um, as these systems are now owned by um, big corporate giants that um, you know, are doing bigger and better things. But we're, um, we're still trying to figure out a, a way to do that um, and our local bike share system definitely wants to figure something like this out. So we're, we're hopeful that, that we'll get that done. Um, and then uh, we uh, continue to try to find a way to uh, get direct access uh, via the cloud to the traffic control system so that we can um, give this type of functionality uh, to people on bike or people on scooter without the need of constructing and installing our own hardware on the traffic control system, which is uh, uh, not surprising, is not something that the um, uh, this is a big is a big leap for uh, city traffic engineers to open up their their hardware and their poles in that way. So we, we have a really great uh, working relationship with the city of Eugene and it's the testing that we've been doing together has been great. Uh, and they did take the leap of faith with us to be able to for us to install something that tapped into the traffic control system. But there's a way to do it that that is that minimizes that type of hardware-based uh, approach um, 
that's what we're trying to do. So uh, we're still working, trying to get through to McCain, um, and we might also play with a different type of uh, traffic uh, controller, um, traffic uh, light controller, uh, to, to play around with this experiment and also give the city an opportunity to experiment maybe with a, a different approach uh, for their whole system um, in, uh, in terms of who's providing their service, but also how to think about the integrated set of traffic uh, signals, not just moving and maximizing the mobility of vehicles, but for maximizing the mobility for people on bike uh, or for scooter. And ultimately, uh, we want these um, this information for, for users to not be app-based, screen-based, phone-based, um, because the last thing that we want is more people on our road looking at screens when they're moving about, but to create a, a screenless, device that for now can just be an add-on to the handlebar or somewhere integrated, but eventually would be just part of the, the, the bike hardware when, when new bikes are purchased that can be you know, hidden inside the handlebars or wherever that might be. But anyway, to create a sort of a screenless, very small size, very low cost, uh, so something that can be ubiquitous uh, regardless of economic situation, um, that it really becomes an asset for people um, in a community to be able to use. And that in such a device, using either auditor auditory signals or really just um, basic um, LED um, lights that indicate you know, speed up, slow down, or, or time to wait until the light changes so that you make sure that people are staying you know, at a red light if that's appropriate, um, uh, et cetera, all other kind of functionality uh, to give to someone on a bike or on a scooter without having the, the use of a, of a screen. So this is what we're in the middle of, of, of right now. Um, We've been having uh, continuing uh, conversations uh, with a variety of uh, local stakeholders, um, and we're, we're just about, um, I think, set on um, the corridor, the testing, the approach. Uh, there's a few, few questions left to answer, uh, but we're, we're moving there uh, to make sure that we can set up the, the installation and the testing in a way that provides some good insight for us. So uh, that's our... Uh, those are our uh, two completed and uh, one current uh, project on trying to really bring the, the existing infrastructure uh, into the modern era uh, and, and workable for people on bike and for scooter. And um, you know, I, I would say that one of the main motivations for this work, in addition to just increasing the, the use of these lower or no carbon forms of transport, is that we're also trying to be really quite responsive to uh, the current realities of cities. So we're really trying to uh, find ways that can be easily uh, adopted and adapted to different situations and different capacities and different resources of different communities across the country. So we are um, not trying to look at a way to totally retrofit the entire traffic signal system because that's a ton of money and uh, and that's not easy to do, but how can we uh, add some tools that increase the um, efficiency, but also the responsiveness of the system uh, to, to people on bike or to scooter using the infrastructure, the staffing that cities currently have, you know, how can we um, plug in and make it easy for more communities to, to create this um, asset uh, for their uh, for their users, uh, without having to, to undergo a wholesale change of their infrastructure. So that's what we look like in cartoon drawing, and I think I can um, I guess leave it there, and we can open it up uh, to any questions you have on the big picture or on the technical side or uh, wherever that might go. So thanks. Great. A lot. Great, yeah, thank you, Stephen and Mark. Um, so we do have some questions um, and you still have time to submit your questions or comments. Um, so first up we have um, uh, questions about the, whether um, scooters should be promoted to the same degree that bikes are. Um, and are scooters a nuisance? Um, what sort of statistics for injuries do we have with scooters and bikes? 
Sure, I'll, I'll take that. Um, if we want to go one by one. Um, absolutely, I'm definitely pro scooter. Anything that's a more space efficient, lower carbon way of getting around is great. The evidence thus far on scooter use is that the, the injury rate is like extremely low uh, per the rides used. And um, typically when, when injuries happen, they are actually due to uh, really insufficient and poor infrastructure. Uh, um, so the same things that create a safer and more uh, comfortable uh, environments for people on bike, namely um, protected um, bikeways on larger roads are the same infrastructure that work for people on scooters. The, um, and then of course, providing that infrastructure for scooters gets them off the sidewalk and, and limits um, conflicts with people walking because none of us walking want anything faster than a walking pace going by us. Um, the average distance for scooter use is around one and a quarter miles. So it's actually a really nice uh, set of trips that are being made, 38 million of them last year. Um, so I'm a pretty big advocate with that. Um, what is the challenge, I think, for cities or the opportunity actually for cities in thinking about scooters is uh, they represent uh, a kind of an instant additional level of volume on our streets. And so not only are the old bike lanes that just have a thin strip of paint uh, inadequate, I mean, those are, you know, those are 50 years old uh, and there's a way out of date of how we should build, be building things. But not only are they inadequate, they're, the typical bike lanes are too narrow. And so cities really need to be thinking seriously about building uh, their bike infrastructure or their scooter infrastructure, not only to be um, protected uh, with a physical barrier uh, between them and, and where um, cars are moving, but they need to be wide enough to accommodate different speeds of users, whether they're uh, kids on a bike, uh, people on a scooter, people on an e-bike, um, space for someone in a cargo bike to be passed, or someone on an e-assist cargo bike to pass. Uh, so it's really actually, to me, an opportunity for cities to kind of leapfrog uh, cities that have not done a great job on on, on doing things for people on bike. Uh, I think the scooters provide a great opportunity to leapfrog into the modern era and, and actually reallocate street space um, for more of these modes. That's my take on scooters, at least. I have a strong opinion. <laughs> That's great. Um, so now we have a couple of questions that are addressing the challenges with the with the research in the app. And so the first one is about um, the difficulty of using green wave on a two-way versus a one-way corridor. Hmm. Oh. So I guess my fight doesn't work. I mean, I'll, I'll start here. I don't know if that was a technical question or just uh, the world is complex and how do we deal with more complexity? Um, you know, it's. I think it's a, of course, like when you have multi-way streets in all directions, there's just more stuff going on that's hard. And I would say either the, the benefits of bike scooter use in most communities now is relatively low. And so, the technology that, that we're using here provides the, let's say, less than frequent need to, to put a call out for, for signals or for giving that information to users. And so it's not a, a huge uh, use, but as more people are, are biking, uh, I mean, really what needs, would need to happen or more people are scootering on, on key kind of corridors at key sets of time, what really needs to happen then is like the signals just probably need to be fixed uh, on certain corridors. So like in the, if anyone's familiar with the uh, bicycle superhighway uh, system in Copenhagen, uh, well, if you're not familiar, so Copenhagen has uh, about half of their trips uh, are by bike. And these are all people from kids to, to seniors uh, for all kinds of modes, not just commute, but just for everything that people are doing. And so, so many people are biking, but they not only are increasing the sizes of their of their protected lanes, uh, but they now have a whole system of what they call bicycle superhighways. And these are kind of prioritized uh, corridors that are kind of main commute, in this case, commute destinations from the suburbs, maybe into the center city. And so on these bicycle superhighways, they're not separated like interstate systems. They're sometimes off street, oftentimes on street, but the traffic signals are all timed so that in the morning commute, you know, 
the way in to the city that they're timed to maximize the, to, to maximize bicycle throughput. And on the end of the day, they're, they're maximized the other, other way, which isn't exactly the question you're asking, but maybe that's also kind of related that there are some opportunities to, to um, sort of short term that when there's not a lot of users, great, here's an opportunity to provide at least some basic information or maybe some basic control to those who are out on the streets on bike or scooter. And then over time, as these modes continue to increase, uh, it makes, probably makes more sense for uh, some corridors to just actually be fixed time based on uh, time of day use. And the nice thing is that, especially with the bike share systems and scooter share systems, there's so much data that we can um, now use that data probably to optimize the um, that's the system in new ways. Anyway, that's that's how I would think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's another question which um, I think we all kind of notice with cars and traffic lights and at certain times of the day and busy areas. Um, but what kind of thoughts are there about signals and how they could be held on green to allow larger groups to pass in one phase? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Mark uh, just sent me an article the other day, and I'll let I'll let him talk a little bit more about it. But uh, I think it was I think it was in Denmark. But yeah, they're doing exactly that. Uh, it was it was pretty cool. They were uh, tracking uh, bikes and and groups of bikes, and actually feeding that information back into the signal controller for some kind of real-time adaptive, uh, you know, phase timing, which uh, is is totally doable, I believe, but uh, it's it becomes kind of a policy, I guess, question for the traffic office. I'll let you say more, Mark, if you want. Yeah, I sort of agree with that. The, the nice thing about having some of the app-based things and the communication technology that it brings up is, is you can get the groups of people biking and, and know that they're coming and do some proactive work. And, and maybe it's, it is a policy decision. You know, do we want to hold greens when there are more than, you know, X three people on a bike or seven people on a bike in a group or within a certain kind of few seconds of each other, you know, to hold the green or not. And you know, I would, I would argue that absolutely cities should make such policy decisions because uh, we have to, we absolutely have to optimize low and no carbon modes of transportation if if any of our communities are going to meet their climate challenges or their health challenges or their equity challenges or if the planet is going to meet its um its obligation to our future generations so that's totally possible uh and, but ultimately it's i mean i think the technology side is not the bigger piece it's the policy side of cities saying that um they want to hold greens um for, for one user versus the other. Great. Yeah, so we have another question and uh, I'm gonna try and, and piggyback on the last one. Um, basically, were there new safety concerns um, that like the users of your app uh, told you about? In, in a sense, so a person might be, uh, in, the app might indicate that you can, that this red light that you see up ahead is going to turn green, but maybe there's a pedestrian still crossing the street, um, for example. Yeah, I don't, I, I, no, not that uh, situation. I mean, the, the, I think I, I talked about the, the other problem, and that was the convoy problem, and that potentially could cause people to swerve out uh, into the into the vehicle lane. Uh, but by the way, I mean, I, I am along that quarter and I see that happening with or without our app. So it, it I Mark's right. It, it, the lane is too narrow. Uh, but yeah, that was the safety issue that we saw that to, to meet our adjustment, then they're going to have to do something unsafe. I'd say that the other thing on the other side is, uh, um, with the app letting users know that the signal so even if you have the app and by the, when you get to the signal, if it happens to be red on, a, on the signal that we could, that we were let, letting users actually sort of um, hit the call button ahead of time, you know, sometimes it's not always green when you get there. 
maybe the uh, uh, had just turned. And so you get up to the light and it's red. And uh, I mean, the nice thing about the app uh, is that it was a, a way to give information to the user that that their presence has already sent uh, has already been um, noticed by the, the by the traffic controller system. So the likelihood of running a red uh, would be lower. And so in this, as, as Steve alluded to before, at this test intersection for the first app, the loop detector uh, is no one except for those of you who are on this webinar, almost no one knows what a loop detector is or what that thing is in the ground or even notice it, notices it. And so, you know, uh, this is actually a quarter that I'm, I'm on twice a day. So every time at that light, I would, um, I'm always educating people about what that thing is in the ground. But most people are waiting in the crosswalk in front of it or waiting behind it or actually waiting with their foot on the curb and the loop detector doesn't go all the way to the curb. And so, uh, you know, there's always users waiting for the light to change for them on a bike, even though, and with a bike signal that it's not happening. And so one of the nice things that the app does, and it's not the only way to do it, as Steve said in Portland, little blue lights are on some of the signals to tell the users that this traffic signal knows you're there. But here we can do that on the app because the app has put the call into the signal. The user can, can, can know that that's happened and they don't have to wait on the, even have to go over the loop detector anymore. And so it, it just adds the kind of adherence to the red. Um, a little bit better. But we didn't notice anything. We didn't get any comments uh, of um, other dangerous situations that may have happened. And um, I mean, I could I guess I could imagine if someone gets really used to the fact that certain signals are always green, you know, the ones that they can um, proactively uh, call to, uh, maybe you can get some people to start having a habit of thinking it's always green and then one time when it's not it's a problem but not really but we didn't hear anything and i'm not really worried about that one mm -hmm. <clears throat> what what is the state of the sort of um the the vehicle so cars and and lights um kind of thinking like when there's not a bike lane and and biking down uh you know a, a, a vehicle lane with cars and uh sometimes the timing of the lights does work out well um but i'm wondering what are the what what is the future with the cars and what they're what kind of information they're getting well i mean cars are driving most of this so uh, I mean, at the national level, the V to X is, is really about cars. Uh, so they'll be getting the, the same, the same information, uh, that we're talking about with bikes that potentially they have, they could, they will be able to put, and because there's car loops, obviously, as well as bike loops, they, cars could put a virtual call in on the signal as well. So, you know, most of this will probably be rolled out on the car side and we're trying to actually you know keep up the pace on the on the bike side so with the the next research project um again you're going to be working with the city of eugene uh, what other sort of partners um do you think you can sort of work with or keep informed as far as bike manufacturers? Are there um, some people who are listening? Well, if there's anyone on the call that's listening, that's great. Uh, <laughs> at the moment where um, it's the city of Eugene and then with our uh, bike share system here, which is a uh, was a social bicycle system, which is kind of part of, of, of Uber or is part of Uber. Um, and so, you know, we'll just, we'll see how it goes. I mean, we, we think that the, um, with the ubiquitous nature of information technology, as some of our, of our signal infrastructure gets uh, smarter uh, as uh, we, we try to um, do things that do um, increase the, priority uh, uh, and efficiency of people on bike uh, or scooter. You know, we really want these things not just to be like the thing that you download on your app, but just built in pieces of, of, of bikes uh, in the future to provide 
you know, some basic user information to make the journey easier and more convenient, um, more supported. I mean, it's really hard to bike in most communities because the infrastructure doesn't care that you're there and it's not, not that responsive and it doesn't feel that safe. Uh, and the traffic signal system, maybe there's loop detectors in a bike lane if a bike lane exists, maybe not. Maybe the loop detectors in a car lane uh, notices you're there, maybe not. And so, you know, the more we can put into the, just the general nature of a bike that someone has, the better for everyone. Sounds great. <clears throat> All right, so it's noon and uh, well here on the Pacific time. Uh, so this concludes our webinar. I, I really want to thank Stephen and Mark for sharing their work. Uh, hopefully we'll have them back to uh, share their next research project with us. Um, and we have uh, many webinars. We did 10 this past year. They're on our website at nitsi.trek.pdx.edu. Um, so please feel free to look for other webinars you're interested in from our past, and we will be promoting new ones for 2020 soon. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.